Hello and welcome to the Squeaky Bum Time Podcast presented exclusively on the Chop Sports Channel of the Premier Streaming Network. We are recording this on Thursday, May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. I am your host, Laurent Cortines. In this episode, Manchester United lose in squeaky bum time to Brighton. Arsenal pile misery onto an abject Chelsea, and we celebrate Napoli winning the Scudetto for the first time in 40 years. But first, Big Sam is back, and what we can learn from new old managers. We've got to get our things out of the way. Please like, share, and subscribe to the show. It means everything. If you're on YouTube, follow on YouTube. We're doing shorts there. You can listen to the show there. If you're on TikTok, follow us on TikTok. We are everywhere just for you. So let's get into it. I've got a great little rundown, but I do want to start with our friend, Big Sam Allardyce, returning to the Premier League. Uh, For those of you who may not know, Sam Allardyce is a very traditional English manager. Uh, he's from he's from the north. He's got a thick accent and he's a big man. Uh, famously kept Bolton in the Premier League from 99 to about 2007. Famously brought West Ham up um, when they had gone down and they've been in the, in the league ever since. Famously would claim that he had never gotten relegated. Uh, he has a bit of a chip on his shoulder in that he thinks fundamentally that he's not respected as an English manager who's from the North. So in his press conference, oh, he's taking over for Leeds, <laughs> who just fired their manager, Javier Garcia, um, and they needed to fire him. But I do want to give you the backstory on, on, on Allardyce, who's famous, who's just one of the characters of the league, and one of the things that makes the Premier League so interesting. Um, these larger-than-life characters and beings especially the managers who we don't have that much access and we want characters. And Sam Allardyce is one of those characters in his press conference. He said that he was as good as Pep, as good as Klopp, as good as Arteta in terms of knowledge, Uh, not better, but as good. And I thought about that for a minute and I thought, you know, there's a little bit of a disrespect for English managers, rightfully so most of the time, look at, Look at uh, Brendan Rodgers, who's Irish, ultimately. Look at Potter, who just got sacked. Look at Steven Gerrard, who is terrible. Look at Lampard, who is terrible. Uh, So some of it is earned, but I think we should go back and sort of respect some of the older managers who've forgotten more football than a lot of people. Um, As much as Klopp and Pep and tactics are interesting, it's still the same 11 players moving around in the same formations. Um, We give a lot of credit to Pep for doing innovative things, but let's be frank. What he innovated this season was going back to the WM, which was by Herbert Chapman in the 1930s. So there's not much to innovate. And Sam Allardyce was an innovator. When he was at Bolton, he was the first to use statistical analysis. He rightly identified long balls for his team that suited his team. He used psychological profiles. He um, he used statistical analysis. He used sports science, all that stuff. And he really had Bolton in Europe a couple seasons. So he's a very progressive manager, but in the guise of a traditional English football man. And he has his work cut out for him at Leeds. Leeds currently sit only on goal difference out of the relegation zone and had just finished giving up the most goals in a month uh, in the Premier League. Gracia seemed burnt out, seemed resigned to being relegated. Already it was done in an interview on The Athletic, like, hey, yeah, it was tough. And there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes with a lot of these clubs. I think the interesting thing is with Roy Hodgson coming in and Sam Allardyce, and, you know, we're seeing, and, and at a, to a lesser extent, we saw Neil Warnock come in at Huddersfield down in the championship and rescue them from relegation. These are these older English managers who are Northern, who have made their life football, and they, they don't get a modicum of respect that I think that they deserve in that they know the game, they know their country, 
they know what it takes in these situations. So when I say these situations, I mean relegation fights, getting stuck in, playing for the shirt, bringing that Englishness that I think um, really is a key factor in winning the Premier League. You've got to have Englishness. You cannot win in England without Englishness. And that's fight, desire, getting stuck in, understanding the rain, cynical fouls, just each league has to embody its country. And I think one of the things that's interesting, and, and, I'll, and I'll get it, we'll get into the results of the week because it was a weird match week. One of the things that I think about with uh, Pep this season and City this season with Holland is as much as Pep Guardiola and the English football institution, which Sam Allardyce is from, he has changed in terms of tiki-taka and, and fancy football. English football has changed Pep. What are we seeing this season with City? Four men at the back, winning games with headers, a big number nine, getting crosses in, 4-4-2, WM. So he's reflecting the culture back on itself. And I think this City side and ultimately is going to win because of its Englishness and because of its fight and because of its spirit. And that spirit, fight, and Englishness is going to be a theme throughout this episode because there are teams that have it and teams that don't. So let's get to it. This week was interesting. Uh, We had a game on Monday, which I covered. We had a game on Tuesday. We had two games on Wednesday, and we just had a game today. We'll go through uh, the games through via their importance. So let's get to it. First, uh, on Monday, sorry, on Tuesday, Arsenal defeated Chelsea 3-1 at the Emirates. And let me tell you something about this game. No kidding aside. This was the worst performance I've ever seen by any high-level team in my life. Frank Lampard should be fired or the team should be fired. This Chelsea side gave absolutely zero fucks about winning this game. They were played through. They didn't run. They didn't close down. They did absolutely zero. And within 35 minutes... Odegaard had scored twice, and Gabriel Jesus had scored. And this game was over. Aubameyang played the number nine inexplicably. He gave up on Chelsea once Tuchel was fired. Every time he plays, he does nothing and gets pulled off at halftime, which is exactly what happened. That is a mark on Frank Lampard. What are you seeing in training that you think this is a good idea? Um, Raheem Sterling did nothing. No, no, Maduke, one of the young players, he actually worked hard. I thought Sterling was trying the midfield of Fernandez, Conte, and Kovacic, nothing. Uh, Conte was doing his Conte things, but no one was working with him. They just was nothing from this group. They even dusted off the corpse of Cesar Aspilicueta, who shouldn't have been playing on this team three years ago. And the fact that he gets dusted off and plays is shocking. Um, this, there's an indictment here on Chelsea that is beyond fairness or possibility. They may not win another game. There's nothing in this team that says they care or want to care. And I think it's really important to sort of recognize the levels of this team. Let's go through some of these guys. Aubameyang is an international for his country, Gambon, via France. Raheem Sterling is a... England team regular up until this last uh, World Cup. Um, Enzo Fernandez won the World Cup in the midfield, was young player of the World Cup for Argentina. Uh, Angolo Kante, two-time World Cup champion. Mateo Kovacic plays regularly for Croatia in a midfield with Luka Modric. Cesar Aspilicueta, Spain international, many caps. Leslie Fofana, on the England squad. Thiago Silva, Brazil's captain, and Ben Chilwell, who missed the World Cup from a knee injury, along with Kepa Abazalablaga, who has been in Spain. This is not a bad Chelsea squad of individual players, but it is the worst team in the league. They have no co- cohesion. We use a term a lot, right? We have a lot, of, uh, a lot of DEI stuff, right? We have anti-racism. Chelsea are an anti-team. Everything about them is disconnected. There's no fight for each other. There's no movement to help each other. There's no support when a player is on the ball that they come to. They don't see passes before. There are no steps before. There are no patterns of play. There are no 
plans that have been relayed to the players or that are getting through to the players that this is what we're going to do. That they scored a goal is a shock and Chelsea and Arsenal had already given up. That's Chelsea. That's how bad it was. Frank Lampard should walk away, frankly, because he's never going to work again if he continues with this team. On the Arsenal side, they do come back into it. We do see Jakub Kiwar, the Polish uh, young player, finally getting into the side for holding after Gabriel, thank God, was able to come back in. I'm surprised that he got the shot or surprised that he was playing before because I thought he was quite good. And then the midfield was improved with Jorginho uh, ticking the ball around with no party. Granite Xhaka also involved. But some of, and then Martin Odegaard's goals were fantastic. On the volley, passes across the box, going through the cones, uh, the passing cones and drills that were Chelsea, gets the end on, on the end of two and just puts them away. Really good goals. And for Arsenal, this is just the best they can do right now. Get themselves off the mat after the loss from City. Get their wins going. Get their machine going. Try and get maximum points and hope that the mighty uh, Manchester City drop points, which I don't think is going to happen. Now, they had, they did take the lead back from City after the weekend, and then City had a chance to respond. So for the next few weeks, next few games, things will go back and forth. But Arsenal did what they were supposed to do. They showed resiliency. They got back to playing their football and kind of have gotten off the schneid of like the disappointment of losing to City. Now they can probably relax and just be like, okay, we just have to do what we have to do. But I do want to really be clear about what's happened with Arsenal. This is a great season for them still. Uh, but the key thing for them is keep going, keep pushing City. I think what everyone wants is don't give this league to City because you ba backed out on the league. Push it till the end, never give up. People will remember that. I think people respect the Liverpool sides that lost to City in those two seasons because they never gave up. They didn't blow it. They just sort of, the points dropped here or there. But they, they never downed tools. They never lost their energy. They always tried to win. I think Arsenal should stay in that vein. And they do have a very, very, very tough fixture in that they do have to go to St. James's Park and try and get something from Newcastle this weekend. And we'll go through the games later on as we go through it. But a good performance overall for Arsenal. And they should feel proud about where they are. Um, easy, easy game. Did what they do. Get their three goals. And then shut the whole thing down. Easy stuff there. Um, only item was, you know, Gabriel did come off a little injured, but nothing, nothing too bad there. Um, Kai Havertz came on, Gallagher came on, Mudrix came on. Nothing changed from um, from Chelsea. They did nothing. They are awful and might not win another game again. I really mean that. It's that bad. It's a freaking catastrophe and that bad. So Chelsea fans, cover your eyes because it's getting worse before it gets better. So within the title race, City maintain our top position. We, uh, City, do defeat the great and powerful West Ham at home. Uh, it was tougher than I'd expected, but City were really in control of this game, although West Ham did make it hard for about a half. Um, but I don't, it didn't, I didn't feel worried. There were moments early in the game where I was like, when is this goal going to go in? Because uh, Rodri had a pat, had a shot that literally just rolled across the front of goal, uh, hit both posts or curved around the goal. Pretty incredible uh, off the woodwork there. John Stone's off target. Uh, a lot of stuff that you felt like maybe City had a shot at. But, you know, Ederson had to make one good save versus. Uh, Bowen in the first half, but City were in control and um, you felt like it was inevitable, but it was a worry. I thought that, you know, um, the back three of the three at the back of West Ham made it hard. Angbana had a good game, got his head on everything uh, until uh, late in the game when things got a little bit trickier for him. Um, Flynn Downs came in for um, Declan Rice and played a good game. Young player. Uh, that that um, that Moyes brought in, but on 50, come at the moment, come at the man, foul outside the box, incredible cross from Riyad Mahrez, Nathan Aki back in the side his first game, he puts it in, incredible stuff. Then, you know, City are very happy, very proud, big moment for the team, we're feeling good, uh, but then, of course, 
Grealish on the break off a turnover from Bernardo Silva, passes it into Grealish. Grealish holds it, draws, draws the defense. They're on the break. Erling Holland through the middle, times his run, chips the goalkeeper. It's gorgeous. He does his restful pose and scores his 35th goal in the Premier League, setting the record for the Premier League. This is Erling Holland's first season, and he has set the record for goals in the Premier League, breaking a uh, record set in 1994. So if I did the math, that's almost 30 years, a 29-year-old record. So uh, kind of a big deal. Uh, I like to put these things in context. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think about like other sports records and you kind of just go, oh, you know, things like that. This is like 1994. This is when the Bulls were winning championships. That's how long that goal record has stood. And now he's broken the dam and he's probably going to break another record. I think last episode I waxed poetic and did the hyperbolic um, Erling Holland talk because he'd broken 50 for the season, but now he's on 51. And now he's, um, now he's got the Premier League goal record. His next step is to break the all-time English football single season record set by Dixie Dean in 1928. Famously, um, Babe Ruth chatted with him and he said, how much money are you making? And he's like, oh, I had a better year. Almost the same season that Babe Ruth hit his 60 home runs. Dixie Dean scored his 60 goals. Now, the context was totally different. The offside rule barely existed. It, it existed in a different way. Teams would play a 2-2-6 with six attackers. It was just a much different game. And I think Everton, the season that Dixie Dean scored those 60 goals, scored 105 goals as a team, which was quite a lot even for them. So Dixie Dean, record in sight. I believe Erling Holland has a potential of 10 more games uh, with the Champions League and the FA Cup final. Um, could he get 60? Could he get nine more goals? That record is in doubt. It's possible, uh, especially City play Leeds this week and facing Big Sam. Um, he might score four. Uh, Leeds are very bad, and um, uh, Sam Allardyce has a lot of work to do. But uh, City play well. Um, for West Ham, uh, this game. They didn't score a goal. They're still on 34. They're not quite safe yet. They're four points above the relegation zone. So they're kind of on the periphery uh, of it. They're one point, a win, two draws away from safety. It's been a bad season for West Ham in the league, but I've talked about them a lot this season. They've just been kind of unlucky. Bowen didn't really quite hit his heights. They tried to integrate uh, Skamaka and a few other creative players. Paqueta, who's been playing more and more often, but Moyes always has this problem of he's unable to integrate a new group. He sort of has to play his one way. And I have a feeling that when the season ends, they're going to let Moyes go and try and expand this squad to another level. They'll probably be in the relegation zone and then they have to bring Moyes back. But uh, we'll see where they are from there. Um, Fabianski made some great saves in this game. And the regular crew from, from West Ham were in this game. But, you know, interesting stuff. I like West Ham and they still have. Um, they still have the conference league to play. They're playing AZ Akmar uh, in, in their schedule, still going AZ Alkmar. I want to get that right. Uh, and then on Sunday, they play Manchester United, who are coming off a pretty poor, well, a tough performance. I wouldn't say it was bad, but to West Ham's point, they're now on three losses in a row. They'll feel hard done by the Liverpool result, which I thought they were in decent shape on, and Crystal Palace, where they shipped four goals and now they've shipping goals for fun two against Liverpool four against Palace now three against City they've got to get their defensive solidity back so that they can get their win and try and see this season out they still have Leeds and Leicester City on the schedule so they are very much in this relegation conversation but I'm very doubtful that they will go down they may even just stay on 34 and be able to finish this thing out I doubt they'll be in trouble uh, we should go on to other teams chasing the top four we have our friends at liverpool who are on a liverpool renaissance right now they defeat fulham one nil on a penalty uh two mosality dispatches they put um fulham away who are having a bit of a hard time i thought fulham played quite well in this game they did show fight but away from home against full against um liverpool is a tough result they get their goal liverpool and they sort of are able to see fulham out i think this is a really interesting type of result for Liverpool where they did grind it out. They did not have to do 
uh, a full-on attack. They actually had some control in this game. Uh, the Trent Alexander in the midfield experiment seems to be going well. He was second in, in chances created for the game, led the team in passes, passes attempted, touches, everything. So what's happening now is um, Liverpool are funneling everything into Trent Alexander-Arnold, and he's able to dictate play within these games and get his ability on the ball into different places. And it's changing the way Liverpool play. I'm, like I said a while ago, I'm so surprised it took Klopp this long to make this change. It seemed as though he was never going to make a change. I guess he had to wait and see how it was until everything was done. And now he feels good about where he is. But I think another thing that sort of changed this thing is Luis Diaz being there. There's a lot more solidity. There's a lot more, lot more options. The up front, all the, the, the front four are all there now. You've got Jota rotating in and Nunez rotating in. And Gakbo seems to be a player that Klopp really likes. Seems to make a difference every time he comes on. So a lot of interesting stuff going on with Liverpool. As a new group, they try and regenerate with Harvey Elliott and Curtis Jones. And they're going to let James Milner go with, you know, a lot of young players. They're still pretty young. You know, we have to remember Trent is only 24. He's got a long way to go. I think they probably have to start thinking somehow about Van Dyke, who's now played way too many minutes, is going to be 32. He's not a superhuman anymore. He's just a good, sorry, a very, very good top-level defender, but he's not interplanetary anymore. And I think there has to be a little bit more solidity there uh, that they can figure out. But this is a good step for Liverpool. They can feel good about where they are. They're pressing that top four space that if any team like Manchester United really falls apart, they're there to pick up the scraps. Um, but they look locked on now for the Europa League. They've got a good chance of getting that spot. And I think from some of the lows that um, Liverpool have felt, they'll feel really good if they can get a, a, a Europa League spot and then have that double chance of, of getting to where they want to get to at the end of the season. I'm just looking for the, for the remaining schedule of, of Liverpool. I just want to sort of go through it. Uh, and just make sure we see where they are. Right now, they're on 59 points, sitting solidly in fifth with the great and powerful um, Brighton right behind them because, you know, Brighton are the best. They still have Brentford at home, Leicester away, Aston Villa at home, and then they round the season out away at Southampton. So tough games, but doable. I think Aston Villa will be tough. C Leicester City will be fighting for their lives, and then a home game versus Brighton isn't so bad. But they are now on a five game winning streak unbeaten in seven after they had lost to Manchester city and really effectively put their top four chances out the window. But, you know, they are in decent shape. They, you know, they took, they took, they took that loss to heart and moved forward from there. So good stuff there. Things have changed. Liverpool looking up so there'd be some optimism going into next season. If they can get their signings, right. If they can get, McAllister from Brighton over the line. If they can get another midfielder like Caicedo, maybe two, maybe three, maybe a defender, just give some tools and some clay for Klopp to play with that he can figure out what to do and regenerate the team. So good stuff all around there for the great and powerful Liverpool who move through and uh, get near the top four. But we have to talk about the game of the day just today, 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 today. Man United go away to Brighton. Brighton wins 1-0 on a VAR-assisted uh, handball result that uh, Alexis McAllister put away in the latest scored goal in Premier League regular season history in the 98th minute. Um, they get their goal. Uh, it was a fantastic game. Just whenever Brighton are playing, you know, you just have to watch them. They're fucking fantastic. They took it to United. Uh, it went down to the end in the 90 plus nine minutes of so the 99th minute, the 98th minute when the penalty was actually taken. Just a fantastic, fantastic, fun game. Um, the boys were taught, we were all chatting with each other during the game and just how great this game was. And it was nil nil. And how we need to really, like, for the neutrals and people who aren't big football fans, you see the result and you're just like, it's nil nil. You've got to tune in. Because this game had fight, Lewis Dunk and Anthony getting into it. Uh, the picture here of, of these teams, they had just played each other in the FA Cup and had another result 
uh, between each other. There was a lot of bad blood, a lot of holdover. Uh, I think there was vengeance on Brighton's mind. So a lot of getting stuck in. Um, the, the referee let a lot go. I think it was Andre Mariner. He kind of had took an old school view of this and just like, you know what, boys, you guys are playing. So they did go and play. It was open. There were fouls. People were getting stuck in. Tackles flying in. Just a really fun and enjoyable game that um, that I could not recommend more. It was nil-nil, and it didn't matter. That midfield of Alexis McAllister, Billy Gilmore, and Billy Gilmore along with Caicedo, uh, a funky funky lineup, but Caicedo played fullback, but then moved to the inside after um, – uh, and CISO came off the field, just a lot of different moving parts. And, you know, Brighton never, ever stopped going for it, never, ever gave uh, United a sniff. And they got their just rewards in the end with the handball into the box. Uh, Luke Shaw, who was doing great as a central defender, filling in for Harry Maguire. I don't even know if he's filling in for Harry Maguire. He's the central defending pair with uh, Lindelof. So, they're, those guys are working their asses off. They're still playing with the four, uh, the four fullbacks because you've got Wambasaka on the other side who went to war again with Matoma. Great battle between those two. Just a fantastic little uh, attack there. Uh, they kept on showing him to his left because they were so afraid of Matoma coming in on the right. But Shaw puts his hand in the air. Nobody sees it. But then the Brighton players are really protesting. Um, and um, you can see it on VAR, clear as day. Andre Mariner goes to the monitor. All he has to see is the arms up. Bingo. Call the penalty. There's nerves. I'm so nervous in this game. It was a really fun, great game. And just one of these moments where if you watch the whole game and you weren't a football fan and you just held your breath for a minute, you would find yourself just being in love with this game. It was a fantastic nil-nil result. Uh, Matoma, Anthony had great chances to score goals. And then a lot of sort of half chances. Welbeck, um, Casemiro had a couple of good shots. Sully March skipped across the box at more than once after he came on, was unable to get his shot off, but Dave was making saves. The, uh, and and um, uh, who was in goal? And, and Steele. Yeah, Jason Steele made a lot of good saves. Just a great, fun game that... Uh, everyone can enjoy. And of course, the result gets resolved in the great and powerful squeaky bum time for real. You just thought United might pull it out, but today was Brighton's day and they deserved it. Uh, what a great team. If you haven't watched Brighton, please just just do yourself a favor. Just watch Brighton. Their next game is... Um, their next game, Brighton has Everton next at home. They should be able to tear Everton apart. Everton's going to come desperate and really try and come after Brighton. But uh, they still have extra games. They have a bunch of games in hand. They have to make up a game from match week 25 and one from 32. Still have to play Everton, Arsenal, Newcastle, Southampton, Manchester City, and Aston Villa. That's a lot of fucking games. So uh, they still have a shot definitely at Europe, definitely at the Europa League. They're really pushing for it. Um, I just love them. If you can't watch Brighton and enjoy it, this is, might be the last chance because there are at least three players that could get picked off from that team. Matoma, Caicedo, and McAllister. McAllister already heavily linked to Liverpool as their new midfield reinforcement, especially after a World Cup. Just high profile, great stuff from them. I love them. I love you, Brighton. Please. Spurs, hire to Zerbe. What are you doing? Just do it. Stop messing around and get it done. Um, just a fantastic, fantastic result for them. A um, couple of items to talk about, and I think we went through them with the, with the games. You know, Leicester, the, the relegation battle is still super tight. Uh, we saw Leeds fire Gracia. We had an amazing Monday game, a 2-2 Everton versus Leicester. I think that Dean Smith has just figured out, you know what? Leicester, uh, Leicester can't defend, so we're not going to try and defend. The Opta Joe of Opta has determined that since 2010, when we ha started having XG, the Leicester versus Everton game was the first game ever with two teams on 
three XG each. This game ended 3-3. So it was literally the highest combined XG game in the history of XG. How about that? What an amazing game. The fact that, that Leicester even uh, gave up uh, goals to <laughs> the fact that Leicester gave up three XG to Everton is insane because Everton can't score to save their fucking lives. Uh, I think I talked about the game already on Monday, but just a fantastic little note there about attacking, attacking, attacking. This is the same thing I said about Spurs. Spurs need to just attack. Maybe Dean Smith should be the Spurs manager. I don't know, but that's what I'm looking at. I just think that they, people need to push and try and get themselves in the way. Uh, I do want to give a little shout out to uh, managers getting changed. If you are at the end of your season, would you just change your manager for the last game of the season? I wonder if we have one more manager change left. There's some teams have six games. Some teams have four games left. If you are Nottingham Forest and you have a win and stay in the league and Steve Cooper is the coach, do you fire Cooper just to see if he can get a bump for that last game? <laughs> Crazier things have happened. It's the Premier League. What's Tony Pulis doing? I'd give him a call. Why not? I don't know what he's doing. He could be doing anything. Tony Pulis, can you really get in there? Um, so odds and ends and bric-a-bracs. Uh, Angela, my friend Angela Jackson, loyal Napoli supporter, has finally had her moment. Napoli win the Scudetto on a 1-1 draw. The goal from Osimhen really sets off the fireworks. And Napoli is on fire right now. They haven't won the Scudetto since 1990 and Diego Maradona. So 1990, that's 10, 20, 33 years since they, last, since they won uh, the league. Just party on uh, Napoli, an incredible season for them. Uh, and respect to my dear friend, Miss Angela Jackson and the whole Italian league. Just letting the Scudetto happen, letting Serie A have its Napoli's champion. Uh, just an amazing season. Victor Osimhen and his 22 goals finally getting it done. And Napoli can party like it's 1990. The ghosts of Diego Maradona are there. Argentina wins the World Cup the last, nearly the last time. Uh, and, an Argent and, and Napoli wins uh, the Scudetto. So good for them. Incredible stuff in Serie A. Uh, there's still a big fight uh, for the top four there, but just cool stuff from City A uh, and good on them. Another thing, I do sometimes cover the Women's World Cup, but in this case, this is the Women's UEFA Champions League. England had two semifinalists, Chelsea, bow out to Barcelona, and then Arsenal lose to Wolfsburg and Andre Pop and the Germans. So the Women's Champions League final in Eindhoven will be. Barcelona Femenini versus the great and powerful Wolfsburg from the German league. Unfortunately, Arsenal was just like, they lost five players. Uh, even their, their talisman who's been out for the season, Vivian Madizma. They lost the captain of England, Leah Williamson. They just didn't have enough to overcome uh, Wolfsburg who were just like a sit back, play deep uh, kind of team and just got hit on a break, made a mistake playing out from the back and Arsenal's ladies bow out in the Champions League. No English team, no English women's team has won the Champions League yet, but they are knocking on the door. The Women's Champions League is really hard to win. It's really hard to make it even past the qualifying rounds. Uh, Lyon, the defending champs there. Uh, let me see if I can figure this out. Uh, let's see. You wait for Women's Champions League. The final is June 3rd, Barcelona versus Wolfsburg. Barcelona are defending champs in the last round. They, in the last year, they defeated Chelsea. I believe Barcelona are, I'm going to make sure that I, oh, no, this is not the right thing. Uh, oh, here we go. Barcelona are undefeated again. I think it's their third season in a row, undefeated. They're, they've only given up five goals all season, uh, scoring 108. It's not a real league right now. Why the Spanish Women's League has 16 teams is beyond me, but um, undefeated, 26 played, 26 won, 100 go 108 goals scored, five against. Barcelona women 
the most dominant team in all of world football, going for a back-to-back uh, UEFA Champions League winners. Their men may be a mess, but their women are holding on and being super strong. So cool for that. We'll all be rooting for Wolfsburg because everyone loves an underdog <laughs> uh, in, in these games. So cool stuff there. Uh, last little piece of items. Yep, let's just go through the weekend looks like this. So we do have the coronation of King Charles II or the III. Charles III, uh, Elizabeth's son, getting coronated as king. Lots of drama there. I could give a flying fuck. But what it means is there is no early game on Saturday. And then we have a nice slate at the 3 p.m. kickoff, which will be on television in England. There are no blackouts. No blackouts. So Saturday looks like this. Tottenham play Crystal Palace at Tottenham Stadium. Wolves host Aston Villa, a Midlands derby uh, of a sorts there. Bournemouth hosts Chelsea. Chelsea. If they lose to Bournemouth, Frank Lampard should go walk into the Thames and disappear. City play the ever-powerful Big Sam-led Leeds uh, at home. This could get ugly. And then Liverpool in the late game on Saturday do host Brentford. On Sunday, the big one is Newcastle hosting Arsenal. That will be a massive game. If Arsenal win that, and they have to, we'll still have a title fight. Then West Ham will be hosting Manchester United. Uh, West Ham still looking for that point. United's form away from home has been terrible, and they have been dropping points and things here and there. So our city, I mean, sorry, Man United do need to get a win. Uh, they, their, their top four is not so connected that they can't that they can just start mailing things in. Then on Monday we have an amazing super relegation fight. Monday, Fulham hosts Leicester City. Leicester City will probably get something in that game because they're flying high and have better coaching. Then Brighton host Everton. Everton played well against Leicester. Like I said, they had those three and a half goal uh, XG, but didn't score enough. And then the mighty, you want to talk about a must win. A must win of must win proportions on the bank holiday Monday. Nottingham Forest hosts Southampton at the city ground. Come on, you tricky trees. If Nottingham Forest can win this game, they will take a giant leap forward into the relegation safety. We're going to find out on Monday, on the bank holiday Monday, who is serious, who is going down, and who has no shot. Uh, I'd expect a result for Nottingham Forest and a result for Leicester City. Uh, Everton, I'm not sure what's going to happen to them away from home, but this will be a third game for Brighton in seven days. So we can see some sort of fight that wasn't that too much rotation. So Monday's games will be massive and we'll cover those right as the show ends. Just like this one is going to end. That was the Squeaky Bum Time podcast with Laurent Cortines. We are the football wing of the Chop Sports channel and presented exclusively by the Premier Streaming Network. We record on Mondays and Thursdays, so be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're listening on Apple, please rate and review the show because it means everything and everyone and everywhere. And thank you, Angela, for watching to the end. <laughs>